Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I'm really surprised that so many of you turned up today because it's really early in the morning, so thank you for your support. Um, so just a disclaimer, I have to, um, um, you know, basically I'm used to working in cave-like conditions in the studio, at my desk with a little lamp, uh, working on my art. So my work uh, speaks for me. So I'm not really used to speaking publicly to a huge group, so if I mess up or if I get a brain fart, please excuse me, and please lend me your support. Thanks. So first of all, I'd like to start off with this painting. Um, if any of you are familiar with uh, Indonesia, uh, they have these fishing kelongs. This was a trip I made with my boyfriend and his family. So um, while I like to do plein air painting, plein air painting is uh, a sort of a painting where you paint a scene that's kind of like a live drawing but for environments. So my take on this place, while it's a real place, um, I kind of romanticize it. So it's not exactly real, real, but kind of a fantasy take on it. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today, fantasy and art. And to say you fantasize about something, that means to say an activity of uh, imagining something that's impossible or improbable, something that doesn't exist. And so that's actually my job, um, working in the game studio. So here are some titles that I've worked on. Some were released and um, some are actually not, unfortunately. Like the top three you see up there, um, those were the titles that I worked on in LucasArts. My first game uh, stepping into the industry was Star Wars Outpost, the one in the top left. Uh, it was uh, led by my senior, uh, Chungi. He actually painted that illustration, but basically this game is an isometric top-down type of game that was meant for Facebook. But because it was too expensive to run, it got canned in the end. So I got lucky and I worked on an FPS Star Wars game. I mean, that's really exciting because, uh, well, I love FPS games, things like, um, has anyone, do, anyone play games here? I'm just curious, play games? So if, yeah, I know you do. Um, so this game, it's a first person shooter. If you guys are familiar with games like Doom and uh, Quake 3, it's kind of like this, but in Star Wars, the Star Wars universe. Ultimately, that one didn't quite work out, even though it was at 98%, I think, to completion. Also very unfortunate, quite heartbreaking, really. Um, so jumping onto the next project was uh, Star Wars 1313. Uh, if you guys have seen the trailer, it's actually, it was really exciting. The fans really wanted it, but ultimately, um, before it got released, Disney bought over LucasArts and, well, it didn't happen. So moving on to Bandai Namco. The bottom four titles were titles that I worked on, and one of them being Star Wars Battle Pod which I'll talk about later. So this is actually a picture taken at my company's lo um, lobby. We have a Pac-Man standing there to stand guard for us. Um, and well, to get to where I am, it was, it came from these influences growing up as a kid. As you can see, uh, does anyone here actually know Sonic? Is, he used to be really famous. I'm not sure about not. You guys know him? I used to play this one. This was the first one that ever came out. And it was actually my first game as a kid when I was in, um, I think I was six or seven. So it was a huge influence for me. Sonic's world was based on nature versus, uh, you know, the evil Dr. Robotnik's. Like, it's a fantasy world where animals versus the robots kind of a deal. And I really liked it. So you can tell how much I love Sonic. That's me, by the way. Um, as my boyfriend says, I look like a little dude. But... That's me and that's my older brother. My older brother was a huge influence for me. He loved drawing and he's actually a um, lecturer at NYP right now. So, me and my siblings, we grew up loving Sonic and I drew Sonic so much, like every day in school, to a point that sometimes I drew it in my workbook and I forget to erase it and I submit it to my teacher and it comes back with like this big circle, what's this? So. We love Sonic, and even though Sonic hasn't been doing great these few years, I still love the big blue hedgehog. That's me at um, TGS in 2014. Now, my first job stepping into the industry was Imaginary Friends. Uh, it was a really cool place. 
I didn't, I wasn't doing concept art back then, but I was mainly focusing on illustrations. So IFS was a great place to get to know really talented people and a lot of passionate individuals. Shortly after leaving Imaginary Friends, I, I was doing freelance writing for three years. And in these three years, um, while doing freelance, I was developing my own personal um, creation, Temple Guardians, which I'll talk about later. But I realized while creating my own IP, something wasn't right. Like, I could illustrate stuff, but it was kind of difficult to get ideas I had, like conceptualize it and put it on paper. So I went back to school, and I went to Feng Tzu School of Design. So upon graduation, I was lucky that uh, a friend of mine, Kai Ng, who is actually the founder, or was it co-founder, of Lick Studios um, in Taiwan right now, he just so happened to be leaving LucasArts, and he said, hey, your portfolio looks pretty decent. Why don't you try giving it a shot, like entering LucasArts? And I, so I did, and it was great. So the next few slides, I'd like to share a little bit about Bandai Namco. This is, um, or oh, this actually was where the company was. Um, they've actually moved to a different building, but it was my first trip to Japan. A lot of snow, really exciting. And that's the lobby, really huge lobby inside. And it was my first time coming upon a, one of these screens. It's an interactive screen. So when you walk through it, when you walk through um, the lobby and you walk past the screen, it actually projects these props onto you. Really cool. Unfortunately, my colleague Mariko, she took it when the props disappeared, so you can't actually see the props. But interesting enough, they used this same technology for one of the Namco games, these arcade machines. Um, I think it was a, a Kamen Rider game. So the little kid stands in front of the screen and it projects the Kamen Rider armor onto the kid. Pretty cool. And in the lobby area, there are these Pac-Man arcade units. And um, I'd like to share something about Pac-Man. It used to be called Pac-Man. So the reason why it's Pac-Man is because it's named after a hockey puck. Unfortunately, the name Pac-Man was printed on the side of the arcade machine, and people would start vandalizing the P, turning it from a P to an F. So you can imagine why they changed it to Pac-Man. So in the lobby area, this is for visitors, by the way. So um, if any of you have a chance to visit Bandai Namco in Japan, perhaps you could try one of these. In the back, they have these uh, Gundam. I don't know if any one of you know, but there's this Gundam game that came out a few years ago. Um, it uses this dome screen technology, really immersive. And so using that same technology, the projection onto the dome screen, we used it for B Star Wars Battle Pod. So have any of you seen, actually seen this arcade machine in Singapore? It's, oh, you have. Have you tried it? I don't, yeah, it's expensive, right? <laughs> um, yeah, unfortunately, we don't really uh, have a lot of units in Singapore. I think there was one in Bugis, but it's not there anymore. So anyway, um, this was my first shipped game, actually. Even though I worked on three previous Star Wars games, those were all uh, shelved. So this, to me, was kind of like my baby. Um, I saw the project from beginning till the end. Beginning in a sense that if you saw in the trailer, things like the X-Wing flying through the trenches, things like this had to be planned out. Like what sort of elements were we going to put into the game? What's the player going to um, experience in these three minutes? So each of these stages, they, they kind of already exist in the Star Wars universe. But the scenarios that play out, they don't actually happen in the movie. So as a creative person, actually I was the only concept artist working on it. So it was interesting. I was kind of like, I was kind of like a storyboard artist come, um, you know, giving out ideas for what happens to concept art, for lighting, for um, the environments, things that you don't see in the movie. So I have to fill up those black spaces. For instance, in um, the Death Star 2 stage, it's a space battle. And so the game developers, they were thinking, you know, what can we put in this stage to make it interesting? You're just flying through space, destroying ships. So coming up with some ideas, it's a really fast process and it's fun because it's really just from pen to paper. 
I drew out these storyboard-like panels that showed two Star Destroyers. If you guys are familiar with Star Destroyers, they're huge um, Imperial ships, really, really enormous. If the X-Wing is this big, the Star Destroyer is this big. So in the, in the dome machine, you can imagine how epic it feels. The, sun, the scenario that I pitched was two Star Destroyers clashing into one another, one exploding and one crashing, and you as the X-Wing have to fly through it to escape it. So it was fun because we had to fill in things that didn't exist. I myself am a Star Wars fan, so it was definitely a fun ride. And this stage, it doesn't exist in the Star Wars universe as well. It's Vader's revenge. So this part happens um, after A New Hope when Vader's ship gets blown away when the Star Destroyer, sorry, when the Death Star explodes. And you're playing as Darth Vader. Your job is to retrieve this laser cannon that's left in the rubble, like just floating around in space. And the rebels actually want to retrieve it for their own use. So the mission is to destroy the rebels. And again, it's kind of like the previous stage where you're just flying through space. What can happen? So as a creative person, you're dealt with, OK, I'm in space. What can I do to make it look fun? So I'm thinking, OK, you know, there's stuff, there's Death Star parts floating around. Give it interesting shapes. And perhaps one of the shapes is the shaft of the laser cannon. So putting into consideration that you're going to be flying through this space, experiencing it in the dome, what would it feel like? Sorry. What would it feel like? So at the end of the stage, you actually fly through it, and the laser shoots through you. That, to me, is a huge success, because as a player, you're excited. You don't want to get hit by the laser, and you also have to destroy the rebels. So it really was a fun stage to work on because it's something fresh. Uh, this is a stage that was added on later on, after episode seven came out. The previous five stages were done, I think, about a year or something before episode seven was released. So initially, we were told that we were going to work on an episode seven stage before the movie is even released. But as things go, it was delayed and so after the movie came out, we started working on it and with very, very limited resources from Disney. So aside from commercial work, I like to talk about little projects that I work on. Little projects that I consider to be fantastical worlds that I go to. And the process of getting there from a little idea to something bigger. So I like to use this project as an example. It's a project that was pitched to me by a friend of mine from Lucasfilm, Wong Kipman, if any of you know Kipman. So uh, he, he told me, hey, um, I've got this idea, and I'd like you to do the concepts for it. There will be a team of people who will work on it, and it will turn into a feature animation. So yeah, I said, sure, why not? So he explained to me. I can't tell the story because I think it's um, he's still going to work on it later on in the future, so it's better if I don't say it. But all you need to know is steampunk and sci-fi. What sort of world do you get? Something like this. So in front of our character is a steampunk world, one that turns into this rustic sort of a world when the rain hits it. And the world in front in the foreground is the sci-fi world. So helping me get there, during the environment, sci-fi to me feels very clean, very blocky. And while I can draw it, in this case, because it's going to be passed on to a 3D modeler, and the director himself, perhaps he wants to change the lighting, I started off in 3D and then painted over it to get something like this. So in creating a world like this, some, con some considerations were, um, some things were considered, sorry. Things like the technology, what sort of energy does this world use? Is it clean energy or is it pollutive? Well, in this case, it's something clean. Therefore, you can see it in the design. It feels fresh. Maybe something like um, out of Oblivion or um, what's that, iRobot, if you guys are familiar with that. So here's some of the interior designs. And oh, 
this. Um, yes, yeah, so I should explain. This was, um, so this is what I was given. Something like this, like a screenshot of the animatic, something that they, they want to um, emphasize on later on in the, in the animation. And it's basically just a bunch of blocks. But in the description, it says it's a heliport where the character hovers over it. So for me as a concept artist, to, I need to you know, pass on these, this idea, my, my design. And the best way to do it was through uh, modeling it. I'm not a great 3D modeler, just to say that first. Um, but I can do enough just as a basis, and then I paint over it. So it's easy for me to change from daytime to nighttime. Same goes with props inside. So it's not a finished 3D product, but it's enough for me to explain what the model looks like. So I just draw over it, put some notes, even have a call-out sheet of what the material can be like. So the second project I'd like to talk about is a, you know, it's a fun project that I did during lunchtime. I mean, I like llamas. Llamas are kind of silly looking, and I mean, who doesn't like llamas, right? So uh, this came to me, um, you know, when I saw this guy walking down the street. It's interesting where we get our inspirations from. So this one came uh, to me when I saw this guy walking down the street. He had like a little bob in his walking, a bit of a belly. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to design a character that kind of walks like that too? Why not a llama? Llamas are silly. So there you go, a llama. And not just any llama, but a merchant llama. And it started from this, my sketchbook. Something that I did during lunch. So it started with um, some ideas of what he does in the day, what he looks like. Try to imagine the sort of sounds he would make, maybe something like a camel, I don't know. It's funny how these things go around. My, uh, one of the translators in my company, Ingsi, she saw me sketching and she said, hey, that's a pretty cool design. And you know how kids, you put them in a room with some toys and they come up with silly stories together? It was kind of like this for me and her. She was like, hey, why don't you give Larry uh, a sidekick? And of all things, it was a little chicken. So I, I don't know if you can see it, but in the left sketch, like above his, his head, there's this little chicken there. It was added on later, uh, actually. You can see the ink is a little different. But it's interesting. So from there, it grew and grew. And we talked about having shark pirates, how um, the chicken has a crush on the llama. You know, really silly things, but it was so fun. So when, when we were talking about it, I was thinking, you know what? It would be cool to actually sculpt it out, you know, just for the sake of it, because it's fun. It's fun to do, so why not? So here's a little um, behind the scenes of how I did this painting. Uh, I wanted to do a scene of Larry saving, oh, by the way, the chicken's name is KFC. <laughs> Very immature of us. But the, the full name, I believe it was Catherine Florence Clarkson, KFC. Um, so here's a progress of how I did it. Uh, started with line work. Um, so because it's a ship, you know, captured by shark pirates, it's a, perhaps a basement of the ship. And this is the kitchen, where she's about to turn into a real KFC. Um, Larry's there to save her. And yeah, so it's a fun little thing that we share, a world that we live in together. So aside from the progress, it all comes from techniques. How did I get here in the first place? This is really old. If you can't see the date, it's dated, I think, uh, 08, which uh, eight years ago. Um, if you guys have seen Yoji Shinkawa's works, the concept artist for uh, Metal Gear Solid, his stuff is like this. Um, really inspiring stuff. And I tried different techniques just to see what fits and what doesn't fit. Uh, this was done for a convention, so I used to do conventions and have a booth, but not so much these days because it's really tiring. <laughs> Same as this. Um, I used to watch a lot of anime. So 
I, I used to imagine like, what if they cross over and what if they mingle? What would it be like? Team Fortress 2, I'm a huge fan. And if you can tell in these slides, I use line work first. If any of you actually do art, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. You start with the line and then you fill in with the colors. So for me, jumping from line work to no line work at all was actually quite a huge challenge for me. Same as this. Um, it's a little old. The proportions, I have to say, it's not accurate, but it reminds me of where I was before. Um, this, again, wasn't like one of those where I sketched with lines and then I painted over. It's more like an experimental thing. Some logos that I did. And, well, I kind of do fan art now. But these days when I do fan art, I try to have my take on it. If you guys can't tell, it's Kylo Ren. <laughs> and who likes Kylo Ren? I know nobody likes him, but I do. Because he killed Han Solo, right? But I think he's so interesting as a character because, I mean, he's a bad guy, but why is he bad? I mean, he killed his dad. And I don't know, isn't it kind of mystifying how he got to what he is today? So. Imagine Kylo Ren if he was a samurai. What would he look like? What sort of tattoos would he have? He'd probably have a Darth Vader tattoo on his arm. And moreover, I was thinking, you know, what if, what if he actually killed the Pado ones and had their braids tied to the back of his hilt? That would be kind of cool. So using my experience over the years, I wouldn't say it's perfect yet, but I mean, I get to try something new every time. And this, to me, this piece was kind of like a stepping stone from lines to, you know, it's kind of painted, but with a different sort of quality to it. So it's important to actually quality check, you know, compare my stuff to what's out there. And this was one of the pieces. So inspiration comes to us in many forms. What sparks it? It can be in a way, in, in a, you know, a sound you hear or something you see. For me, this piece, it came to me um, when I was listening to uh, trailer music. You know, the sort of music that they play when they play uh, those trailer from, like, movies like Lord of the Rings, and it gets your heart pumping. So I was listening to X-Ray Dogs, I think. And, well, it sort of inspired me to do something massive something that had motion to it. So it started with really huge brush strokes in Photoshop, and I thought, you know, it's a nice wavy line. What can I do with it? How about a serpent? Now, to back it up, I have a favorite genre, and that is sci-fi versus nature. It's a rough sketch, but it kind of explains the sort of feel I'm going for, the sort of genre I like. Also, I like animals, so you can see animals in a spacesuit, kind of my thing. So, all this piece, um, I wouldn't use it for portfolio if I were to apply for a job, but I think this one kind of resonates with me in a special way because, sure, it's just a robot in the sky, but how did it get to me? How, what sparked it? So, I'd like to share that with you. Was, so, what happened was one day I was walking home from school. And at night, you know, maybe like a 1 km away from where I live, I was walking and I saw this construction building. So you know how the construction buildings have that? They, they have like this green color mesh over it, a netting or something. So at night, it was kind of blowing in the wind and they had these construction lights shining up towards it, giving it this very epic sort of a feel. And I thought to myself, wow, that's, that's actually pretty impressive. I mean, it's just a building, but it sort of sparked this emotion, like I wanted to recreate that feeling, and I mean, I wanted to share this with someone. You know, like how you find a, a shop that has a sale and you want to tell your friends about it, kind of the same thing? So for me, I was thinking, you know, I could very well just take a picture of that building and show it to my friend. But it's so different because to them, they might just see a building. So using that spark that I had, I wanted to portray that feeling. And so I use this as a way to convey it. A robot in the sky, very much like that building I saw at night. 
I think I'm a little, yeah, short on time actually. So, same as this um, song, I was listening to a song from an anime that I never watched, but it was quite inspirational. So, if you can't tell yet, I have a tendency of, uh, you know, uh, making the environment pretty epic. Whether it's the creature, whether it's the environment, uh, in comparison to the scale of the human. It's something I thrive off and something I really like to do. Here's another example. Um, does anyone know Sopu Bomberman? Bomberman from the Famicom, a really old game, uh, sprite-based, but if you reimagine it, what would it look like? I'd imagine something like that. So this is from my personal project, Temple Guardians. This piece is, I think, seven years old, but it still resonates with me very much. It's kind of like I, you know, one of those projects that I go to when I think about something epic. I, I come back here. And this scene, because it's so deep embedded in me, deeply embedded in me, um, as one of my assignments in school, I also worked on it, you know, just expanding the universe, expanding on the scene. Interesting enough, I got my hands on a HTC Vive. I'm not sure if you guys can actually see it, it's kind of bright. But basically, I tried recreating this scene in the HTC Vive, painting it, um, by the way, this was my second try on the Vive, so it's a little choppy, but the idea is there, that within one hour, I was able to recreate this scene and actually live in it for that one hour. And I have to say, the, the experience is just amazing. When you take it off after one hour, you feel like, you know that, that scene in, uh, in exception, sorry, Inception, when they inject the girl and she goes into the dream world and she wakes up, she's like, what's this? Like, reality isn't enough anymore. It was kind of the same thing. So when I took off the goggles, I was like, wow, that's actually pretty amazing. I, I wish I could live in there. You can create anything you want. This was my first, try, first time trying out, painting out on a Vive. Uh, the two blobs, if you're wondering what they are, they're actually um, two mascots that I created. So using this technology, I'm able to create this 3D space and actually live in it. Unfortunately, only I can experience it, but hey, you know what? You can pass on the goggle and someone can live the same experience. It's really cool. You can actually scale it, small or big, up to you, and then you paint around it whatever scene is it you want to portray. So, in, so this one is actually simply, um, you know, I was just messing around doing the waves first, and I thought, you know what? Why don't I make, you know, put some depth into it? Why don't you, you look underwater? What would it look like? And above you, what, what would the clouds look like too? So in this last section, I like to share some of my sketches. Um, for me, it's a way of archiving my ideas, things that I can go back to. This fire demon, which actually came from a concept like this. And some other creatures that uh, inhibit the same world as it. So these sketches, I do it, uh, you know, maybe after work, before bed, or maybe even during lunch, whenever I feel that spark of inspiration. So if you're wondering, how do you get started? I say, just think of what is it you like to do? What sort of genre is it you like? So it doesn't have to be sketchbooks, but maybe even digitally. If you can't really do it traditionally, why not digitally? It's kind of the same thing. So this started with a sketch, and well, I brought it to Photoshop to further enhance the design. And what sort of environment does the, env uh, does the character live in? So this is considered like a simple sketch just to get the idea out. And this one a little bit more um, detailed. It's a different project, but it kind of conveys that idea that, you know, some thoughts are put through it. And to remember what you, 
what inspired you. Maybe you just leave a note there and come back to it another time. So yeah, some of the sketches are really random. I can't explain this one. So it's more of like a shape thing. Like, you know what, I'm going to draw wolves, so why not? Same as this. You know, little animals and army men. A raccoon and a bear fixing a tank, why not? Solid snake in a top hat. Even things that don't even make sense because they're just fun to do. So after work, if I find this really therapeutic. Like after work, you're so stressed out and you know what? I, I just want to get this energy out and just draw faces. Maybe when I'm angry, I might draw something angry like this. Or something scenic. This was actually from the fishing pond, really, um, in Indonesia. So, yeah, even, even no matter how fantastical the creature is, but whatever it is, there has to be uh, a groundedness to it. So, uh, in this case, it's this griffin thing. So, I wanted to understand how it moves. And in order to do that, uh, do up a skeleton version of it, what happens inside its body and perhaps the sort of different armor it can wear. And sketches, they bring different, sometimes they spark ideas and stories. In this case, it was a, a really short one, but a sweet one, because I, I, I just wanted to draw a cooking pot that walks. It sounds silly, but I want to do a wolf and a cooking pot, so why not a wolf sitting on a cookie pot? And my friend, she saw this, she was like, Hey, why is the wolf eating the sheep? The sheep is so cute. Why can't it be something more friendly looking? And it's like, okay, you know what? Maybe the wolf is a victim and it doesn't want to eat its food anymore. So why not? So it ends with the wolf spending Christmas with its food. Yeah, so with that, I hope um, I conveyed something to you. And I'd like to explain this just a little bit before I end, that um, just like the first painting I showed you, this was a plein air painting that I did in Melbourne during a holiday there. And this was the living room. I could have just painted, you know, just a normal living room with a normal city in the background. But as I was painting, I couldn't help but wonder what it would be like if the Pacific Rim robot, you know, the one that comes from Sydney, what if it was standing somewhere in the background? What would it look like? So there you go. My job is to rom romanticize things that you don't, things that are impossible, the improbable. And with that, I'd like to leave you with a quote that I, that I took from Ratatouille, actually. And I don't know if uh, you guys remember Ratatouille, but I watched it so many times in the cinema, and every time I watched it, the last part when uh, Anton Ego talked about how Remy, um, you know, he found out about Remy being a cook. It, it always brought a little tear to my eye because this quote goes, not everyone can be a great artist, but a great artist can come from anywhere. But I'd like to add a bit more to that, and that is, a spark can come to anyone, anywhere as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to keep this up here real quick. So we're going to do a short, very short Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions for Dorothy about the concept art, how it comes about, does anyone have a question? Over here? OK, let me just. And I'm jingling. Hi. Um, thank you for sharing everything. I was just wondering, do you ever get creative block? And if you do get creative block, what is your, what, what do you do to kind of get the juices flowing, per se? So the question is creative block. Um, it's funny you should say that because the past few weeks I was uh, going through a huge block. Um, sometimes, you know, ideas come to you very naturally. Something gives you that spark, but there are times that it doesn't come to you. So for me, it means it's just empty up here. It's, you need more input to have more output. So, I mean, it's kind of like eating. You got to eat more to, you know, give out more. Um, in the same sense, it's kind of like 
you watching a movie. Sometimes when you watch a movie, it gets you excited, it gets you thinking about different things. So for me to overcome that block, it actually involves me looking at other artists' stuff, whether it's on ArtStation, maybe looking at my colleagues' stuff. Um, two of them, uh, they're pretty good. My colleagues are Trisha and Lewis. They sketch so often, it makes me feel quite ashamed of myself. But when I see their stuff, it's actually really inspiring. So maybe it's hanging out with friends, friends who are doing the same thing. But I think more importantly is getting more information and more input from art books, maybe games. Thanks. Does anyone else? OK. Thank you. Do you have any daily ritual that you makes you to draw daily? So, so it's daily ritual, like, yeah, a, like uh, something I practice every day, is it? Yeah, and normally what do you practice every day? And do you also like, how do you kind of make yourself more productivity, productive at home? Because sometimes home is, can be a bit noisy and yeah. a bit hard to concentrate, and especially how you balance your family and your work life. Okay, so um, it's how to be creative and productive yeah, busy, at home. At home. And also how to like, find someone who is like has similar interests as you i think similar interest wise you can try going to different forums or websites mm -hmm. uh, i can't say much about that because the people i hang out with are kind of that circle already so i'm i'm sorry but productivity wise and um practice i can sort of relate to it because the three years i was doing freelance there was something i learned was that not only was my fundamental a little wonky, was that the other thing was I wanted to get my stuff out, but I wasn't being productive. And I realized the problem was me not planning out what has to be done by when. That deadline is actually really important. It's kind of like if you're sitting in the office and the art director comes up, hey, I need this by tomorrow, by hook or by crook, you have to get it done by then. You have no choice. It's kind of the same when you're doing your own stuff, except you have to play the art director and tell yourself that by this date, what has to be done. Even if it's a big project, it's okay. You, you just give yourself small milestones. And I think that works. I see. Do you mean like draw anything that is related to it or draw something like until you can reach to that stage? You're talking about the ideas or...? Not just the ideas, you're kind of like in the way how you can produce your kind of like... And you, I mean like your practice, like on what do you normally practice on drawing... Oh, okay. Um, so, sorry, because I'm trying to be clear as well in this. Um, I think maybe you should be clear on what is it you want. Like, for example, for me, it was uh, coming up with, say, for example, let me see if I can find something. For me, it was my personal project, Temple Guardians, which consists of uh, mechas and creatures. So for me to get that, it requires me to do research on relevant things, like, you know, draw, draw things like birds and, and creatures, things like this. So, the more you practice it, the more familiar you are with it. And the more familiar you get, the more interest you have. So it kind of builds up. It's kind of like a snowball. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> OK. All right, maybe we have time for just one last question. If no one has a question, I just want to um, can you go back to that very last slide real quick? Okay. So something I was talking with Dorothy about uh, before we started was her last image, which I was kind of doing some research as I was posting about her on social media. And I saw this sketch, and she had posted about it being a room that she painted while she was on her travels. And will you just kind of talk a little bit about that? Because I find it really fascinating. 
Oh, about this room in particular? Yeah, no, just about when you're traveling and, and instead of just taking a picture of something, you're, you're completely drawing it, capturing it, every aspect, and it's something I think that seems more memorable than that way. All right. Um, actually, one example I can give is um, the... Does this thing loop? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I visited my company's headquarters in Japan, and if you remember, the building is this weird... Uh, a-shaped building. So I actually painted in that building and while the design itself is interesting already, when you take a picture, it kind of like, yeah, yeah, it's a picture. I, I see the shapes and it's kind of cool. But what I wanted to do was paint it in a way that I see it. So through my eyes, it turns out very differently on canvas. Things that speak to me, like the windows, if they have a little shimmer there, Maybe the camera doesn't catch it, someone else may not see it, but to me, I see it, and it's something I want to portray in the painting. So anyone who sees it, they have that same emotion as me. It's same as the, um, well, yeah, so when I painted the interior of the Bandai Namco uh, headquarters, I actually printed it and I gave it to my Japanese colleagues, my bosses who actually brought me there as a way of saying thanks. And, they were so impressed. He said, you know, I never knew there was this weird girder in the ceiling with those lights. He said, how did you know it was there? I said, well, it's there. It's just you never saw it. So, yeah, I think during plein air painting, it's fun. Technique-wise, it gets your muscles uh, working and you get really familiar with the medium. But more importantly, I think it's about sharing that feeling you get at the moment when you're at the scene itself. So... Yeah. And like you said earlier, being more observant, I think we could all benefit from just being a little bit more observant of your surroundings and where you are at that present moment in time, right? Yeah, thank so you so much oh, for coming you. and joining us. Thank you.